I happen to be the leader of a very large organization of 10,000 researchers. I happen to be a scientist when I started. I became a physician scientist in clinical research, and I'm a, now I'm a business scientist. So I happen to be the leader of a very large organization with fantastic people, and I will talk to you a little bit to, uh, to what we do, what we stand for. And I'm also convinced that uh, doing good in the world uh, is part of being successful, and uh, that, that has uh, shown to uh, combine global public health with a very targeted Western pharmaceutical business, it's not impossible. And so we do that. We have a special division of global public health in our company where we, where we provide the resources to, with the science we have to make impact in the world. And uh, that's, uh, uh, that is, uh, that's absolutely the combination of the two. Dr. Paul Janssen, when I, uh, when I was a young guy, he told me, um, one day HIV will be solved with one pill once a day, it will available be, to, be available to everybody and it will be safe globally and used globally and HIV will get under control. That was in 1990. And I thought the guy is crazy, it would never happen. But uh, he said also, start, never give up. You will have a lot of failures, but when you continue, one day you will be there. And I think we made a lot of progress since then. I also learned that um, if you do science, you have to work on things which matter. And I have a very simple business plan. It's we calculate years of life saved and years of quality of life generated. And if you do that well, then the business follows and you can continue to invest in research based on the outcome of your research. Um, also, it's about people. So first, go and find the best people. Let them follow their passion and let them choose their teams. It's about following, aligning the passion of people with the business of your company. And you have to make sure that, that they are very passionate about finding solutions for important problems. Uh, a very important management principle is you take the risk, I take the blame. Yeah? You give uh, ability for your people to take risk and when it fails, you stand up for it. When it, they succeed, you give the success to them. And that's the principle on how you make a large organization work big time. So um, I learned of my life that innovation takes a long time. And there is an innovation threshold, which always moves up. So this is probably, if you want to learn about how to uh, do drug development, you have the level of innovation and you have time in years. And we talk about 5, 10, 15 years. But the level you need to pass to get a drug which is better always goes up. Whether, and that's a dotted line, regulatory, uh, quality, generics. So if you start low on the innovation curve, you very quickly, after a few years, hit the line of no differentiation. And you don't have a product which, which is valuable. If you start on high, you have to go fast, but you can make, you have a chance that at the point you introduce a medicine, it's differentiated and you make a difference. And that is what it is. High level of innovation and speed to development is the way to uh, go. Now for a large company like ours uh, to win, we also have to make sure we work on the best opportunities. And what we do today, and this is just one example in our cancer group, B, B cell malignancies, we follow every molecule which is ongoing somewhere in the world, whether it is in the outer circle in the lab, in phase one, in phase two, in phase three, and we follow the progress of every molecule to make sure we know that at all times what we are investing in is still something which matters and makes a difference for patients. Because if you come too late with something which is lower than providing no benefit, you fail, yeah? And it doesn't work. And so I prefer to invest in things which really matter and really... Um, now, going back 30 years and 30 kilograms, I was in, in Congo in Kikrit. And Kikrit was, uh, is very well known from the Kikrit Ebola virus, yeah? And it's as exactly in that surgical room where the Ebola crisis broke out in 1995 and killed about 95% of the people working in that hospital. And it led, led, I wasn't there at that moment anymore, I was there in 88 to 90, but it led, left something to me. And then something else was there, it was polio. This patient on the table here, there were about 2,000 patients crawling on the ground because there was no polio vaccine in the area. Yeah? But also, in this room, several people had HIV already then, and uh, this is exactly the table where the surgery happened, where the, the Ebola uh, patient came in and, uh, and infected the entire medical community of that hospital. And most of the people who you see on the slide died. 
So long time uh, after that, several years after that, um, I was with Polyans and we developed two drugs which didn't work. We tested four drugs in the clinic, uh, Tibo, Alpha Apa, Loveride, and those who were long enough around it, we didn't know what was wrong. Yeah? It was one thing, it was resistance. And so we were one of the first to do the resistance on a very large scale, which learned us that, which learned me, that when we gave an NNRTI to a patient, one week later, the patient was resistant. But we only measured the, uh, 14 days later, so we didn't see even, see even effect. We didn't have viral load at that moment. So we decided to start a, a, um, a diagnostic company to evaluate the, the HIV resistance on a very large scale. We did, uh, um, we did at the same time, uh, we started a company together with Rudy Powell's. We did drug discovery and development. We each invested $30,000. Anya did the diagnostics and, and, um, and Patricia did the drugs. That was the start of uh, Tibonac and Verco. We very quickly scaled up to a very large company in, in uh, HIV resistance testing. We did phenotyping, 1,000 cultures per patient. We did 120,000 of those, and we sequenced 600,000 patients through LabCorp and Quest. That gave us a database which, and the samples to learn on how to get to next generation medicines. And it was a massive effort. Uh, a few hundred people worked on that for 10 years. Yeah? We provided uh, resistance reports to patients all over the US and also in Europe to tell physicians what to do, what not to do. At the same time, we learned how we could make better drugs. Yeah? And, um, and so that was the protea, HIV protease uh, somewhere mid-90s. Um, each, each green dot is a mutation, and you could see the var variation of the virus was enormous. Yeah? We identified more than 450 different mutations we had to deal with in our drug discovery. Through screening and to uh, design and to uh, many different uh, chemical uh, top people, we found a new medicine which was uh, Darunavir, a protease inhibitor in collaboration with the NIH, uh, chemistry at, uh, at uh, Chicago and the chemists at Tibotech, we were able to bring a, f a new medicine and today it's still the most prescribed protease inhibitor, which was active on all mutations we could find at that moment. And that gave us a very strong basis to make a drug and I'll tell you in a little bit what happened. So we had late uh, stage patients we got into that and it's just one of the studies where we had control versus Prezista. People were extreme resistant and we could see a very nice effect on patients and that led to uh, an approval. In parallel, we uh, had the follow-up on, on Thibault, which was a Travarine, which is now in Talens. It was active on multidrug resistant NNRTI, but we had like, one big challenge. We couldn't manage the pharmaceutical pharmacology very well or the pharmaceutical absorption and the pharmaceutical formulation. So we started a clinical trial with 18 pills twice a day, which was crazy, but the patient survived. Yeah? And during the phase two, we were able to go to eight pills and then later on to, two, to four pills and now two pills. When we combined the two drugs, we had a spectacular effect in patients with multidrug resistant um, HIV. And again, we got it approved based on the combination. Sorry for uh, the miss here on the, on the, uh, on the slide, but uh, the two studies were positive and we got it to the FDA and we got it approved, um, Prezista and Intellens. Um, that was uh, based on perseverance, massive uh, sequencing, massive phenotype, and massive testing of new drugs. We got to two drugs which are still very important tools today for advanced patients with advanced HIV. People who had uh, three, three months of life expectancy, three to six months of, of life expectancy, and this is my good friend Jens. He's uh, by now, I think, one of the longest survivor patients in the world. He was infected in 87 and is still in good health. He's always been on experimental drugs until he got to Prezista and Intellens and now an uh, integrase inhibitor, and he is still in good shape and uh, working around the world. The same with Tico. He was a patient who, uh, from uh, Guglielmo Montaner in, 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 uh, in uh, Vancouver, he uh, was exactly just saved a bit, uh, within a few months of, uh, he was terminally ill, and again, today, Tico is in good shape, still on the medicines, and uh, doing very well. And so that was um, the learning on, okay, we can treat late stage patients with broad spectrum, what do we do next? Yeah? So, 
Um, we had a drug which uh, Paul Janssen discovered, um, and it was an NNRTI, which was broad spectrum, but a very potent molecule. And nobody believed that it would be differentiated. The only uh, very important thing was it was very well tolerated. Versus if you compare with efavirenz, we brought it into the clinic and it, uh, it worked very well. It was e equally, uh, almost equally efficacious. It was a little bit difference between uh, efficacy and, uh, and safety, but the clinical outcome was the same. And we uh, brought that now in combinations with um, with FTC and Tenofovir in Complera, in Odefsi, and now also in Juluca, the combination with Dolutegravir. So this drug is used in the background of three different other combinations and is very widely used in the world as a combination drug. But Paul Jansen was a very smart guy. Um, he saw in the features of these molecules, we can do more with that. And this molecule had long-acting capabilities. It was a very important molecule, it had the right physical chemistry to make a long-acting injectable. So we started early on, we started with a long acting to try to see can we prevent people from getting infected. But very quickly we realized there's too much uh, NNRTI resistance in the world, so that is not going to work. Yeah. Um, this is just uh, the phase three study showing uh, we got it approved based on that. And this is uh, from a total different other field where I'm working in with the team, is that we have been working in antipsychotics with long acting. And we have been able to go from once every two weeks to once every month to once every three months, once every six months now. So, and that is with, with um, nanocrystals and a very special formulation, you can get very potent molecules in a very stable pharmacology for a very long time. We said, what if we do this with, with HIV medicines? And there were two medicines, one at GSK with FIF, with dolutegravir, and another version of that, cabotegravir, and ours. And both we were testing it separately. We said, what if we bring this together in a therapeutic field? And, and we conceived the idea of induction maintenance. Let's put the patient on three pills, bring to undetectable, switch to two pills, and go for long acting. And rightly so, if you look at that, um, now every every two, every four weeks, every eight weeks, we did a phase two study. And if you look at the results, it was just amazing. You can get long acting injectables once every month and once every two months, you can maintain undetectable viral load in patients. I think from one pill once a day to going to one pill, uh, one injection once a month, the phase threes of that are finished. We are going to, together with uh, VIV, that's going to be submitted. The phase threes for the every second month are still ongoing. So uh, the phase twos were good. So we have to see how that works out. And that's to be expected. And uh, we hopefully we can get to once every month or once every second month. And that will mean hopefully six injections a year to keep uh, HIV uh, maintained. Um, I'm going back to, I don't know whether I can come, go back to the previous slide, but I just want to show you why this is so important. This slide shows that the, the moment you stop the, the antipsychotic, it takes up to almost, um, uh, it says 300, 400 days to get to a 50% relapse of the patient. So during so, to a very long time, you can keep uh, you can keep pharmacological levels at a certain level, which which are therapeutic. We have to test in HIV because of the, of course their resistance is a problem. You don't want to go too low, so you need to have a very good level for a long time and have to timely timely intervene. But it gives you a window to uh, to intercept if needed. So the long acting um, is now in development. We'll uh, get that going. I won't go in detail. All of that, and going back to Africa now, and this is a, a slide from an Ambassador Burks, is when, when HIV happened in the, in the 80s, you see the dotted line there is the life expectancy in, uh, in the world. And all of the African countries, they had a life expectancy which was similar running with the life expectancy in the world a few years less, but the quality of life was improving until HIV happened. 
most of the countries lost 20 years of life uh, of, their, of their entire population. This is on a population base. Yeah? And so what you see happening from 1990 to 2000 and mid to 2005, 6 is that, that the life expectancy they lost in those countries is massive. Now it's coming back, two things. It's massive therapy, but also prevention. So it's, it's a combination of the two, which is, um, which is bringing it back. But it's not solved, because today there are more people infected per year than there are put on therapy in Africa. And if the WHO says, WHO says or the UNA says it's under control, it's absolutely not under control. The incidence might be the same, but the population is growing. So the pool of patients is growing. So we need to find other solutions. We developed, an, uh, with, together with IPM, a vaginal ring to, uh, with an uh, antiviral in, and try to get to prevention for women, which is a major problem in Africa where uh, condom use is a very much challenge, very challenging, and women can't enforce that. And um, now we are working on an HIV vaccine. Yeah? And so we acquired Crucell, and Jaap Goudsmit and the team have been working for many years on, on the basic vaccine platforms. And, uh, and the vaccine platform, the non-replicating vectors, which they developed as well as um, the cells to, uh, to produce vaccines, was a very attractive proposal for us to, uh, to bring it in and to start working on an HIV vaccine. We just don't do that. We also do a polio vaccine. We have a Zika vaccine, an Ebola vaccine I'll talk about, and then... Um, many other vaccines in the making, but uh, I'm very proud that we have been able now to bring the HIV vaccine to a clinical trial, collaboration with Gates, the Gates Foundation, and the NIH, HVTN, and uh, we are enrolling at the moment 2,600 uh, young women, because it's only women uh, in that study, because they are the highest risk in southern Africa, and hopefully we get a positive sign out of that. Yeah. The, it is, a, um, it is a mosaic uh, vaccine, and some of you know about it, um, where we use the Prime Boost with, uh, with uh, two different, uh, two different uh, vaccines and uh, over one year administration. And in animal models, we have worked uh, for many years with the NIH and the US military group, uh, Nelson Michael and Dan Baruch, on the combination of which type of uh, vector and what type of insert is giving the best protection. We got at a certain point to a, a 95% protection per injection, per challenge, and an overall 66% in, uh, in the non-human primates. And at that, that moment, we, uh, we decided we go into humans. We did a 400 study, a volunteer study and tested uh, the same regimens we, we tested in the animals, in the non-human primates, and we found the best regimen which uh, could uh, give us the highest chance on protection. And we are running that study now, and hopefully in 21, we'll have um, 21 will have uh, the first results of that. So working on treatment with uh, three medicines and several combinations as well as on prevention, whether it's topical, whether it's vaccine, uh, and then the long acting, has brought us to, uh, I think, has brought a lot of, uh, of years of life and quality of life to many, many patients. During the work, and what is happening now in Africa, is that TB has become the, uh, a bigger killer than HIV. Most of the people who die now in Africa is either of TB or HIV, uh, MDR TB. And so in our screening at Janssen at a certain point, we found a new medicine, um, a, a new molecule, which was a very unexpected mo uh, molecule. It was a uh, bedacolin, an ATP synthase inhibitor, which was only active on mycobacterium. If you imagine an ATP synthase, you never ever use that as a target because you have to be extremely specific or you kill people. Yeah? Um, and so, but lucky enough, this molecule, and it was the only one we ever found, was on non-mycobacterium, was not active, but if you look at it, very high activity on all mycobacterium. And uh, we decided to, um, to develop this. Uh, big challenge, the half-life, terminal half-life of this product was six months. Yeah? And everyone said, never do this, a terminal half-life of six months. Well, you don't know. If it is a safe molecule which can be used, then it, it's not a problem. So we started uh, a long time ago on this. Um, mechanism of action, I can't go into that, but uh, it is, uh, it is um, in the energy cycle of the mycobacterium, and it's a very important molecule uh, killing uh, uh, both um, um, 
uh, living and non replicating and non replicating bacilli. It was published in Science by Kuhn Andries. It was a major discovery, and many people tried, but so far we have not yet found ourselves one other or nobody, uh, nobody else. When we did the first clinical trial, and this is not this, in, in people with TB, we could not measure activity. And that was people who had tuberculosis, drug-sensitive tuberculosis. And that was the reason the drug works slower, because it's working on an energy cycle. And we couldn't do a long enough experimental study to show big activity. So we had to go immediately to XDR patients. And that is the most challenging environment you can work in. It are people who are locked up for six months in order to get their meds in. They are very infectious. And, um, in Southern Africa, and we did five drugs plus active, five drugs plus placebo. You have to have a good drug to show something if you do, if you do that. And this is the result of that. It was published in the New England Journal, and it was also the, 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 um, it was also the basis of our approval. Uh, the first thing was that we uh, were able to act to to uh, to bring uh, to. Uh, Time to conversion was significantly faster, and time and the number of conversion was significantly more. That means for these hospitals that people now, instead of six months in hospitals, can be in one month or two months in the hospital. It gives more capacity, and at the moment, uh, most of the people now in Southern Africa, in South Africa, get access to the medicine, and in the last one and a half year, we treat more than 70,000 people with uh, spectacular results was published in the New England Journal, was approved, and uh, initially we had a challenge. Now, this slide is not very clear. I couldn't get the colors changed. But um, um, this, uh, in the beginning, in the phase two, we had a imbalance in debt, and we had a very challenging uh, regulatory uh, pathway. But when, we, when it was used on a very large scale, and this is done on an, an observational study by South Africa, almost in any type of, of uh, patient, the, uh, the benefit was in favor of the drug. And based on this, the South African government unilaterally decided to provide every patient with MDRTB now uh, bidacolin. It shortens the regimen, and it gives m much more cure. And now they can change even treatment strategies and leave people out of the hospital to do it in out clinic. Very interesting, doing further research, we now found four new targets, in addition to the one we have now on TBE, the ATP synthase inhibitor, and we are making now molecules against each of these targets. If we use those together, like the conversion, uh, what we did in HIV, yeah, we can block the TB bacilli completely. There is no escape possible. Uh, say, never say never, but um, we are going to test this and bring it to a triple or a quadruple, if needed, new therapy to shorten therapy and also be able probably to treat uh, latent TB and eventually maybe also NTM uh, might be a possibility with these new combinations. Now, getting a drug is uh, approved in the US. I just want to show this slide that then it's not over. Yeah? So this is just a timeline now from 2012 approval in the US, where in the world we got approvals in the meantime. So we are now six years later, and we still only have approval in, let's say, half of the countries in the world. It's a massive uphill battle if you have a new medicine to bring that to the global, to the world. And in every country, you have to do additional studies and have additional challenges. But we'll do it because of years of life safe, quality of life is uh, what we uh, stand, and this is one of our drugs with a major uh, effect. And then, last but not least, um, in the Crucell portfolio, when we acquired it, there was a vaccine which they were developing on Ebola. Yeah? And the entire company said, never, ever, what the hell are we going to do with Ebola? I said, oh, wait a second, I was involved in that, let's not throw this away, we go and, uh, and, and, uh, and go into clinical trials. Ebola is now, and most of you know about uh, the, the, the East Congo uh, outbreak in the war zone, it's a really critical situation at the moment. Um, I was in Sierra Leone on the ground uh, during the Ebola outbreak to uh, set up our clinical trials. It's quite something to live in an Ebola uh, region. Uh, but we, uh, we got a good chance on, on doing this. Yeah? We got uh, a prime boost again, and that together with, with, um, with an MVA, uh, 
um, from another company, which, which we combined with an A26 from our company. And when we do this in, 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 in non-human primates, yeah, in a prime boost, either one month in between or two months in between, um, um, by the, 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 the MVA comes from Bavarian Nordic, I missed there. Um, it was a very simple thing. You vaccinate non-human primates, you, you challenge them with Ebola, 100% protected. You don't vaccinate them, 100% dead. Yeah? So that was like a quite black and white situation to say, hey, we can do something here, we'll do it. Within 18 months, we scaled it up, we brought it to the clinic, we have now 2 million vaccines available, and we started phase 3 studies. So, um, and we have uh, exceptional good data with long-term persistence both on uh, the cell as well as uh, the antibody as well as the cell of immunity. And we are, uh, we are moving now, uh, it's now uh, uh, up to 360 days and even longer. And if we challenge the, the people who have been vaccinated again with the vaccine, they have a logarithmic increase of their immune response. So it clearly is a, is a strong anamnestic response, which, uh, which shows that, that the vaccine works. Um, we agreed with NIH and with the FDA that we could go through the animal rule. That means uh, that it's not activated often, but here we need to do that because you don't, can't do real clinical trials, controlled clinical trials. We have done 7,000 uh, volunteers now, as well as several hundred non-human primates. You do that in a blinded way, and you compare the humans and the current of protections between humans and animals, and then you, you, uh, you do the unblinding. We are at the stage that we, uh, we can move on with our submission, and hopefully we get a product approved in the next year and uh, be available to vaccinate uh, large scale, especially healthcare workers. Why non-replicating vaccines? It is uh, safety wise, um, if you have replicating viruses, you get a lot of side effects, fever, arthralgia, and, and a lot of problems. Uh, when you use non-replicating vectors, you can get a very good uh, Im immune response but at the same time, you have a safe uh, vaccine which you can use, and uh, it's now used in 7,000 people with more, with uh, with a very good safety profile, and uh, we hope we will get there. Um, this was only possible thanks to an enormous collaboration. Yeah, uh, this was uh, U.S. government, uh, Europe was involved, um, all the countries uh, who were involved in um, in the in the epidemic. And when this type of thing happens, we were able to bring regulatory reviews down to one day. Normally, you have to, wait, have to wait, meet some months. It was so much organized that we could go from a, from a vaccine in the lab to upscale and starting large-scale clinical trials in less than 18 months. Uh, 300 people, full-time, day and night, worked on it. And uh, lately now, we have the results. Again, um, you see... Uh, Besides what I do in global public health, we do a lot in, uh, in other areas like cancer, cardiovascular, and, and, and neurosciences, um, oncology. Um, it's all years of life, safety, years of quality of life generated. But what gives me my greatest um, reward is the fact that using the science, you, we, in virology, we have developed over so many years, I think it is not going to be a bigger impact than uh, what the virology community has done. Um, if you calculate uh, probably 50 million people who are going to live uh, probably 20, 30 years longer, we talk about a billion years of life saved through the community in virology. And that is like amazing. Yeah? It is almost unheard of what, what, what that happened over the last 20, 30 years. Now, what, what uh, Stephen Dix was saying is never give up to try to find the cure because we are not going to see uh, the, the challenge of HIV in Africa is year after year more people will be treated, need to be treated. It will go from 20 to 30 to 40 to 50 million. They all need medicines for the next 30 to 40 years and it's going to be a huge challenge. The next HIV resistance epidemic is going to come up uh, from Africa, I'll tell you. It's not over. We will need new drugs because uh, compliance is completely different level. Uh, very challenging. So if we don't find new solutions we'll see a new wave of an AIDS epidemic happening in the world um, if we don't continue the science. And we as an industry, we are the connectors between the basic science and the clinic. Yeah? And that is where, where 
where we are good at and where we can work with the scientific community to bring forward new concepts, test them out and see whether we can, uh, whether we can uh, bring something useful. We did that with the HIV vaccine. Hopefully it works. If it doesn't work, we learn why it doesn't work and we'll go forward. In Ebola, we hope that it works. If it doesn't work, we do the same. But from time to time you win, from time to time you lose. But if you don't try, you never get anywhere. And that's where, uh, where I, uh, I, I hope that the senior people in the room who can encourage the young people to do the next round of science in this space is going to be very important to get to the final solution. When I was first in Africa, I visited a few villages where there were no people anymore between 25 and 45 years old. Everyone, and this was the typical family, a uh, boy and a girl of 12 and 11 years old, and then a few youngsters, two goats in uh, front of the house, and the two, the parents buried in front of the house. Yeah? villages completely with no... Now, that has changed in the meantime. And why it has changed? If only everyone with HIV can get um, 10 years of life, you solve the orphan problem in Africa. Not the whole orphan problem, but the HIV orphan problem. Because people have time to grow up their kids. And so why it is so important to expand medicines and to make sure people take their medicines is for many reasons, happiness in life, but also to give young, young kids a life which is worth living and education which can make them better people over time. And that's why uh, we have to continue our work because uh, hopefully either we can vaccinate or we can cure. Yeah? All of this is only possible and I happen to be the leader of a large organization and fantastic collaborations uh, and fantastic uh, uh, also funding collaborations between all of these organizations and what we do. I'm not going to go through all of it, but it started with Polyans and Eric de Klerk, Rudy Pauls, Eddie Arnold, Peter Piot, Joop and, and Charles in the early days, uh, Brendan, Sharon, Kurt Hertogs, uh, some of you, John Eriks and his team, Michuya, uh, Aaron Ghosh, uh, John, you all these people, one of another time, were involved in what we are doing, and it's absolutely not just our achievement, it's the achievement of a fantastic group of people with a huge commitment, solving HIV, solving infectious diseases. Thank you. Mm -hmm.